Okay, and welcome to the Uncomfortable Conversations podcast, the untold stories of the 3HO Kundalini Yoga community. I'm your host, Guru Nishan. And before I introduce our special guest for today's episode, I would like to read to you the intentions that I've come up with for why I've brought this podcast into manifestation. Um, number one, the intention to break the veil of silence that is long permeated and continues to strangle the 3HO Kundalini Yoga community in the name of neutrality. Number two, to validate and help clarify the complex feelings of those who have joined this lifestyle, were born and raised into it, and or have practiced or taught Kundalini Yoga. Number three, to encourage active listening to uncomfortable conversations from our community as a revolutionary act of self and collective healing. Number four, to let survivors know that we see them, we believe them, we love them, and we will fight for their truth to be addressed. Number five, to let teachers who are denying, gaslighting, or spiritually bypassing know that what they are doing is willfully ignorant and re-traumatizing victims. Number six, to illuminate the inherent racism, homophobia, cultural misappropriation and exploitation that perpetuates the teachings, 3HO lifestyle and overall community ethos. Number seven, to stop the perpetuation of gaslighting and victim shaming by naming it for what it is. Number eight, to dismantle internalized shame, guilt, toxic positivity, and light washing mentality. Number nine, to honor all of the parts of ourselves that have been forgotten or silenced. Number 10, to honor every body that has come through our community, both named and unnamed. Number 11, to encourage people to do their own research, process their own emotions, get somatic therapy and other support as needed, draw your own conclusions, and be critical thinkers rather than just blindly follow anyone. Your story matters. Please share it when you're ready. We're here to listen and to support you. So I wanna welcome our guest for today. Um, very, very excited. Dr. Ron Alexander is a mind body, <clears throat> mind body psychotherapist, international trainer of healthcare professionals, specializing in creativity and trauma. He is the author of the widely acclaimed book, Wise Mind, Open Mind, and soon to be released, Core Creativity, a mindful approach to awakening your creative abilities. He was one of the earliest young scientists in the West to study meditation and kundalini yoga throughout the 70s. He was recruited by Yogi Bhajan to co-found the original Kundalini Research Institute and the Center for Health and Healing at Cedars Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. He has been teaching yoga psychology, mindfulness, and trauma-informed yoga since 1974 and travels the world now teaching and conducting trainings and workshops. So before we even get started, and I welcome you to the show, I want to just uh, say that I learned about you um, through the Facebook group when all of this broke open back in like March, and you shared this early story from back in like the 70s, and it blew my mind. And I had no idea until I just got your bio the other day for this podcast that you have such an extensive background in trauma-informed healing, somatic therapy, mindfulness. So I'm really excited that you're here. Hey, wonderful. <laughs> Pleasure to be here. <laughs> and I want to thank you for the quality of work that you're doing by conducting interviews like this and your uh, podcast in giving um, a platform for people who have been victimized by Yogi Bhajan and uh, many, many other uh, gurus and swamis and yogis and people of power. Yes, thank you. Um, 
I was inspired by hearing all of the stories that really broke open over the last few months since last March within our community. And I found myself feeling frustrated inside that all of these stories were being shared in private groups and private Zoom calls. And while that was revolutionary or it felt that way for our community, um, it wasn't enough to me. I was like the public, this needs to be in the public domain so that it can't be whitewashed over again. Yes, and it's really important to also note that I'm on Maui right now visiting. And last year I was here the exact same time and I was visiting with uh, Pamela uh, Premka uh, Dyson and I had given her um, a blurb for her book. So I'd, I'd read it in advance. And I'd also been involved in the lawsuit in 1986 with her and Kate Felt. I did the psychological evaluations on both of them. Oh. So a lot of the, the stuff in the book it wasn't new to me, but what's important, I think, for me to say on record is when her book came out last January and she underwent such severe assaults and public attacks on that she was doing this for money and uh, fame, you know, which are the constant things that people in the 3HO community, some of them, um, level towards her. And um, we were sitting in her little office up in Makawao and having tea and she showed me the galleys of the book. And it was clear to me, she had no idea at all of what was going to unfold. It was as if she was just, she had written her story with purity for the need to tell the truth, Sat Nam, and yep. interestingly enough, she was one of the founders of the journal or the magazine that was called Beads of Truth, <laughs> the play on Beads of Truth. And I, I would have to honestly say, of all of the people I ever came in contact with when I was involved with 3HO and Kundalini Yoga, Kremka was one of the purest. Mm. And when we get into it and we talk about the research that me and my team did, um, it was involved Premka. Interesting. So you can explain what that even means in terms of like yes. having mm -hmm. pure energy or something. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, let's go ahead and go back because I know that um, your lens to the early days really matters at this point because it's such a, an early framework. And um, as we know, context matters. So tell us how you got involved in 3HO and just take us back. Okay. Well, from 1970 uh, to 1973, I was part of a research team studying uh, at the, the beginning was Zen meditation. And then we began to study Kundalini meditation and Kundalini yoga. And <clears throat> I was at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst and we were consultants to the Veterans Administration Hospital in Topeka, Kansas. And there was a joint project studying meditation and the applications of yoga and trauma-informed yoga for Vietnam veterans at the VA and then in conjunction with the Menninger Psychoanalytic Clinic in Topeka, Kansas. And that was a very uh, esteemed and historical uh, clinical foundation that was primarily psychoanalytically oriented, but the some of the senior um, psychoanalytic trainers were very interested in meditation and yogic uh, research. So they brought me and my fellow cohort, his name was Rama Karantin Khalsa, but Dr. Alan Como today, down to Topeka over the course of two or three years. And we started to um, utilize the Curly and photography machine. And basically it was an electronic box uh, that used film and you'd put your hand in it in or like a leaf or any kind of uh, object and it would measure the aura. And so we'd been doing that for a couple of years, uh, studying the effects of medication and meditation mm. on Vietnam vets who had gone through severe trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder at the hospital and uh, through the Menninger Clinic. And so in 1972, 
I started taking a Kundalini yoga class at University of Massachusetts Amherst with, at the time his name was Guru Shabad Singh Khalsa. And today he's well known as Dr. Stephen Josephs. And he was a, a graduate of Harvard University and he was in the School of Education at UMass Amherst. And he was teaching this Kundalini yoga class. And so I went a few times and um, I got high as a kite in the class. And uh, he talked about th th there was no need to um, no longer take marijuana or psychedelic drugs. And he talked about a vegetarian diet and uh, living holistically. And so I started going to class on a regular basis. And at Smith College, I was a student at UMass Amherst, but I was also minoring in Buddhist studies at Smith College, which at that time, it wasn't a co-ed uh, private school. It was a, a exclusive school for girls. And they had one of the most premier Buddhist studies departments in, in the nation. And we organized a course with Professor Tai Uno to one quarter, we were studying advanced systems of Buddhist meditation, Buddhist psychology. And okay. then in the fall of 1972, we decided, well, we'll have a, a world religions course through the Buddhist studies department and we'll invite in guest speakers. So we invited Alan Watts, Gene Houston, Dr. Stanley Krippner, um, Suki Roshi, um, and Yogi Bhajan and Swami Satchidananda. Mm. So Yogi Bhajan came and he gave his lecture. And so my uh, meditation team cohort and I went up and we introduced ourselves because Dr. Steve Joseph said, um, I'd like you to meet these two young scientists, uh, this Ron and, and, and Alan, and uh, they're studying meditation and they wanna study you. So Yogi Bhajan immediately put on his light bulb of like, oh, how can I make this work for me, him? <laughs> and so he started, you know, seducing us with uh, you two, you know, I'm reading your aura. You two are going to be great scientific saints. And now what 23 year old, when some guru from India tells you that you're going to be a scientific saint, doesn't want to jump on that wagon, right? <laughs> and coming from an Irish Catholic background, the word saint was, you know, everybody wants to be a saint, right? Mm -hmm. And he was already working on us. And um, he, we mentioned to him that we were going to be coming out to interview at graduate schools in February. And this was October of 73. We were coming out in February of, of um, I mean, 72. And uh, we were coming out in February of 73. And so we went out and we were um, interviewing in San Francisco and Sonoma. We came down to Los Angeles and we stayed at the Brentwood Ashram. And then he wined and dined us every morning for one, two, three hours. And, uh, you know, it was really setting us up uh, to fatten the calf. And so that when we came out that fall of 73 to go to graduate school in, at Sonoma State University. We were continuing our research studies on Kirlian photography, uh, yoga, Kundalini yoga, and uh, meditation and the human aura. And that's what we wrote our dissertations on based upon our research. Yeah. And so we invited Yogi Bhajan um, because we said, well, we wanna study you. We were present a year earlier at the Menninger Clinic in Topeka, Kansas, when Elise and Elmer Green and their, and their daughter uh, did the study on Swami Rama using their biofeedback lab. Yeah. And they were able to um, chart. It's a very historical study where he stopped his heart for two and a half minutes yeah. because he was in Samadhi. Right. And they had electrodes on him. They were running the EMG, the EKG, the EEG. And for two and a half minutes, he flatlined. So he was clinically dead. And it's, it's uh, you can Google the study, Swami Rama. Okay. H Himalayan Institute. 
and we were just ob observers of, of that study because we were there to do our own studies, but we happened to be around the same day and you know, looking through the glass. And so when we met Yogi Bhajan, we said, well, we want to study you. So of course he said, oh yes, you can study me, but I want you to come out and I want you to start the Kundalini Research Institute. And I want you to, to study um, Kundalini uh, yoga and research. So we come out to Sonoma State and we start a small little ashram. There's like three or four of us graduate students. And we invite Yogi Bhajan to come up that uh, October. And so he comes to the, uh, the ashram and he looks around and he's looking at, at all the different rooms and, and I can overhear him say to Sat Simran, no, we can't stay here. It's not private enough, they'll hear us. And I remember saying to my research cohort, they'll hear us what? Like, he doesn't want to stay here because we're going to hear him. And then Rama at the time said, um, oh, maybe he, he's, he's going to be doing deep meditation and all, all that. Now, I'm a Bostonian. And I grew up very street. And I said, hell no, I think he's going to be having sex with these girls. I mean, who travels with three beautiful young women, right? Right. So it's time to, to do the research study with him. Like, can I pause you real quick? I want to context a little more. Yeah. What's your name? Like, you're a full on yogi in the ashram yeah. wearing a turban to give us perspective, right? So what's your name yeah. again at this time? Shama Kiran. You're Shama Kiran. Then there was Rama. That was Rama Kiran. Rama Kiran. And, and then there was Guru Charan. And then Guru Charan. Uh, and that was like the KR, that was the Kundalini Research Scientist ashram yes. group. Yeah. Uh, Guru Charan was the kind of the director. And then okay. Rama Kiran and I were the co-directors. So it was three of us. Okay, thank you. Okay, now keep going. Yeah. And so we take out all of our equipment, our machinery, and we've got several other people who are part of a research team who are not Kundalini yogis, yogis, but they're interested in participating in, in the studies because they're involved in, um, we were also studying psychiatrists, nurses, healers, psychics, um, very rich cool. background. Yeah. And we were co-working also with the research lab of Dr. Thelma Moss at UCLA. She had a Curlian photography research lab and she was doing similar work. And so we were involved uh, with her. So when it comes time to do the study in the afternoon, Yogi Bhajan is sitting on, on the bed and all of the um, acolytes are around him. And we take out all our equipment and we're ready to conduct and measure, you know, his meditative and yogic abilities. And he says, um, no, 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 you, you cannot do me. Um, uh, my brain frequency, it will melt your machinery. And he asks Pam, Premka, to sit next to him. And he says, she will do, you, you study her, you study her brain. And so I already, again, being a Bostonian go, okay, this is a weird hustle. Like we're supposed to study this guy. We come all the way out from uh, the East Coast. We move out to the West Coast and he's not going to let us study him. We're going to study the student. So we do the first study so with This her. is going on in your brain at that age. You're in your 20s and you're actually yeah. thinking this in real time. And then are you expressing it to your research team? Um, well, in the moment, I wasn't, but... Okay. When he left that day with his entourage, I had this huge kind of almost falling out conversation with the other people on the research team that were Kundalini yogis, whereas the ones that weren't, they were more on my side. Ah, and, so and right saying, then, there's the whole entourage, you're noticing this, you had already heard the thing before, yeah. and said that out loud. So then, yeah. okay, go ahead. Yeah. And so we put our equipment on Premka, Pamela, and we study her. And what turns out uh, later after we develop all the film is Yogi Bhajan asks her to go into um, unity consciousness, advanced samadhi, 
God consciousness in infinite consciousness. And so to, to make a long research conversation palatable for the listeners, in brief, the luminations or the emanations from her fingertips on the curling and photography film in each of those states of consciousness had a progressive amount of illumination in a progressive series of increased yellow, gold, and eventually all white, which told us as researchers that she actually was in unitive consciousness. So she was able to, because her dedication and devotion and study of meditation, Kundalini yoga yeah. at that time in, in her life well, was so pure that we were able to actually chat those four states of consciousness. Mm. So then we fast forward. So that's in the fall. We said, okay, but stop. I want to actually have you explain what happened after they left, after the entourage oh. left. We want to yeah. hear that little, like the side, like what happened in that moment. Okay. So the entourage leaves with all the pretty girls and, um, and we had prepared food for like three days for him and clean the ashram from top to bottom. And he, he decided to go back to San Rafael because he had more privacy. It was a room upstairs. And the only people that could hear anything was the guard out, outside the door. And another interesting tidbit is a guy that you should, if you haven't interviewed. Um, he's coming. He's coming. He's coming. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so right. keep going on your story. Stay there. Stay there. <laughs> All right. So they leave. And I say to the research team, WTF, with, he just blew us off and he refused to let us use our equipment to study him. He's the yogi, like something doesn't fit here. And so we had like a, about an hour of conversation and I was accused of being negative. And I said, I'm not being negative. I'm just using my rational mind. We're supposed to study him. And now we've just done a, a research study with his student. So I convinced the team that, okay, in February, we're gonna set up another appointment with him in Los Angeles mm. at his headquarters in the back room off Proust Road. And we're gonna bring all our equipment and he can't kind of weasel out of, out of the study. Exact same thing happens. He takes a phone call and we've got all our equipment laid out and we've got our research team of six people in there and he talks on the phone for an hour and 10 minutes. And I'm going like this, WTF, what is going on here? And he's just rattling on, he's talking in Punjabi. And then he gets off the phone and he goes, I've ex extended all of my pranic abilities on that poor soul that I was helping. <laughs> and he calls Premko up and we have to wait like another half hour. And what's important to point out here is all of the people that we studied, no one ever made us wait, no one was ever late, and no one ever refused letting us study them, except Yogi yeah. Bhajan. Yeah. And this went on, we did this three different times. And the third time after we studied Premka, I just gave, gave it up. And that's when for me, it was in like 1975, I started scratching my head and yeah. thinking of like an exit plan. Like this just doesn't add up. Yeah. It was the, like the beginning for me to be moving out of the, out from it all. Mm -hmm. So it was all starting to like go for you. In, this is 1975. Yeah. And then You're I got still licensed. still carrying on research though, right? You're still yeah. a part of like studying the science of Kundalini research as a research institute, but you've just kind of like left that as a question, like he's dodging something and there's something not right. Oh yeah, he's dodging something. He clearly doesn't want us to study him. Um, and the other thing that came up was between those times we tried to study him, um, he told a couple of stories in front of us at a Tantra course in Santa Cruz. And of course, being young scientists, 
we had both the desire to be enlightened in the Eastern mystical uh, new age thinking caps on of like anything is possible. And then we had Western scientific caps of, mm. well, you, you believe what you can prove. If you can't prove it, it's just a belief, but it's not real data. Right. There are real facts. And when you're studying something, it has to be verifiable and observable. And then you need to be able to write it up. So at the Santa Cruz course in 1975 in the fall, he tells a couple of stories. And we're sitting in the front row. And again, we had all of our equipment. He blew us off. And he tells a story that, and he's told us, it's in the um, collected teachings. And the story is that the way that he got the secret um, Kundalini yoga mantras is that he uh, hijacked a, a helicopter at gunpoint at the New Delhi airport. And he had the helicopter pilot uh, allow him to climb down on a rope up in the Himalayas. And he went into this cave and with gunpoint, he got this Tantra yogi guy, yogi, to give him all these secret mantras. So story number one, ah, science, ah. fact. I said to my cohorts, this F-16s, the New Delhi Air Force is one of the biggest air forces in the world. If a helicopter had been hijacked by gunpoint, by a mad yogi, <laughs> they would have scrambled him and either blew him out of the sky or they would have grounded him. Two, and, and, and I confronted Joe Ibashan about this yeah, at that course. I said, so um, how come the F-16s didn't um, scramble you and force you to go down. And you know, he just talked nonsense. And then I said, and so you climb down a rope and the helicopter's hovering against a cliffside in the Himalayas. And how long were you with the yogi? And he goes, oh, just 10 minutes. And I said, and where did the helicopter go? And I could see he was stumbling because he hadn't even thought through the story, he had fabricated this elaborate story of commandeering a helicopter, hijacking it by gunpoint, and then going into the cave and that the yogi gave up all the mantras to this guy, Yogi Bhajan. So that was, wow. that was one story, right. I wow. mean, just beyond, beyond believability. Right. And yet all of the students at that course were just sitting there you know, and blissed out and taking it in as if there's truth to it. Mystified. It mystified. And yet being again, a young scientist, I was thinking this is like lunacy because it doesn't even add up. Mm. And then at another course in February in San Francisco at a Tantra course of 76, he tells a story and again, he would always invite us to, whenever he knew we were uh, at, at a Tantra course or an advanced teacher training course, he would invite us to come in and sit with him. Um, and so- Because you're the young scientist, right? Exactly. You're legitimizing, you're gonna legitimize him. him and this body of work he's bringing. That's right. And so he tells this, and of course, I confronted him about the helicopter and the yogi. And I said, why would the yogi give up the secret mantras simply because you walked into a cave with a gun? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, and how did you walk into the cave if you were hanging from the bottom of a rope? How did you get from the bottom of the rope? Because the helicopter's blades are like 10, 15, 20, 35 feet long against the cliff. How did you get from the bottom of the rope into the cave? And you could see him just stumbling. And then he made up some crazy thing of swinging the rope and he was able to swing into the cave and then the helicopter arrives sometime later and he's able to jump and vault and catch this rope. And you know, what, at 10,000 feet below, it just, it was all bogus, bottom line. It was just a bunch of hooey. 
but not many people are asking critical questions at this point. So like you're, it sounds like you're asking a question like how come, and it sounds like he didn't feel that very often. He was very rarely challenged by, I think, anybody. And so he tells the story in February of 1976 at a Tantra course in San Francisco that this woman came to see him and she, her gynecologist had told her that she had stage five uh, terminal malignant uh, ovarian cancer. And so that she went to see Yogi Bhajan and he, he with his x-ray vision, looked into her ovary and he realized that he, he could, with his fingers, put his hand up inside of her vagina. He wrapped his fingers around this malignant cancer cyst, plucked it out, and then asked his assistants to bring a bowl of yogurt. And he put yogurt up inside there and she was healed. And so- He's telling this story as a lecture. As a lecture. I see, okay. Right? And at that time in history, we were already part of what was called the Kalsa Clinic and the Center for Health and Healing at Cedar sinai And so we were working with Saram Singh Kalsa, MD, who's a very prestigious and highly, highly respected uh, internist. And he and Jaswant Singh Kalsa, current day known as Jeffrey Hawkins, MD, they were two of the very beginning holistic and behavioral medical uh, physicians in the functional uh, medicine movement. Wow. And I remember asking Dr. Saram, like what he thought of the story. And he's a very devoted uh, student to this day of Yogi Bhajan. And he just shook his head like this. Because it, it he was trained as a, an internist and him and Jeffrey Hawkins, uh, Jesuit Khalsa, they knew that this was just bogus mm. as I did. And so I asked Yogi Bhajan, I said, well, how long ago did this occur? And he said, two months. And I said, well, why don't you send her for an ultrasound and let's, and, and get an X-ray too, and let's see how healed she is. He refused to do it. And he just went into blathering, you're being negative, you're not being a devoted, trusting student. Mm -hmm. And all the while, again, I'm thinking more and more things that don't add up. Right. <clears throat> so then what happened? So in um, 1976, in the spring, Rama and I decide we're going to leave Kundalini Research Institute because we had spent the last three years transcribing many of the early lectures. You're transcribing and, lectures. Yeah, Yogi Bhajan's lectures. And we're working with artists to draw the original Kriyas and like what you see in the current day training manuals that go back to that time period really come from myself and Rama and us transcribing and working with various artists to do all the drawings. And so- This whole time, since you guys had formed, since you had formed this little research group, you're basically writing out the Kriyas, the meditations, like yes. putting them. So it wasn't just a study of say the result, it was actually like putting them down to paper. Yes, both, that's right. So you're and, both and, doing the study of what's the efficacy of these practices while also just getting them down on paper. So he does a lecture and you make sure that gets down and so that you're creating manuals. Yes. And so we created, we created the very first tier of the teacher training manuals mm. because Yogi Bhajan anointed me to do several things. One is when there was advanced teacher training every year in um, September out in Pomona, all the teachers of Kundalini Yoga throughout the world would gather to do an advanced 10-day uh, course with him. 
And he would have myself and Guru Charan Singh uh, teach the morning segment to the teachers. And then he asked me if I would teach pre-tantra. So I would do the hour to uh, 90 minutes in advance of him coming at all the solstices in New Mexico. And so myself and a, a woman who's now deceased, she was a psychologist and a Kundalini Yoga uh, student. Her name was Just Jiwan Kar Khalsa and her English name was Dr. June Bawa. And he anointed her to found the very first Hari Institute, the Humanological Awareness Research Institute. And so that, that's another thing I'll get into in, in a moment. Okay. Humanology. Yeah, but good. Most importantly, so we're listening to these lectures and then transcribing them and then getting uh, the Kriyas and the meditations and the postures uh, drawn up by various artists in, in the Pomona Ashram. And after maybe 20, 50, 100, 200 hours of listening to him, again, <laughs> I come to realize 95% of every lecture is just like junk, junk science, junk psychology, uh, mm. junk spiritual teachings. He'd say, today I'm going to discuss the neutral mind and I'm going to give you the topology of the various models of the mind. An hour before that lecture, he invited me in and he said to me, okay, Shama Karen Singh Khalsa, tell me, what do you know about the mind? And I had just read this book. It was, it was called Models of the Mind. And it was a psychoanalytic book on the various topology of the pre-conscious, the, the subconscious, the unconscious, the collective unconscious. And so I spent like an hour talking to him about everything that I had just read in the book. He went out two hours later and he almost verbatim, word by word, gave the exact same lecture. Everything that I had just shared with him. Wow. And so as we were gleaning through these lessons, we realized maybe 5% of every talk there was like some gold. Yeah. And it was usually connected not to the lecture, but to the teaching at the end of the lecture, which was usually some pranayam, some um, one or two kriyas, and one or two breath practice meditations with mantra. Yeah. So as we were gleaning through, we realized, Rama and I realized, <clears throat> there isn't a body of knowledge that he actually went and he studied and he's imparting it to us. Right. He did study with various yogis and he did master, for example, Shabad yoga, the sound current. Huh. And he did master mantra yoga and he did master how to put various kriyas together in various sequences to facilitate certain responses. And so we went in one day and we confronted him. We said, it, there's not a, a preordained body of knowledge here or technology. You're making it up as you go along. Because he said he, this. Yes. And he smiled and he said, oh, my two scientific uh, soldier saints, sons, you, you have discovered the, the inner secrets to my teaching. He, he said, I have mastered how to put the Shabbat, the sound current together with the various mantras. And we said, it seems to us that you take the mantras from Sanskrit, even you have some Tibetan Buddhist mantras in there. You take them from Gurmukhi, Gurbani Kirtan, Guru Granth Sahib, um, that you, you pick and you choose from a whole host of places. But the, what your mastery is, and I, I will respectfully acknowledge, he had a mastery, mastering ability to synthesize. He could pull things from a variety of sources mm. because he figured out the lowest common denominator. You know, if you take a mantra like Wahe Guru, 
you can spin it and teach it as wahe guru. You can teach it as wahe 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 guru wahe guru wahe 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 guru because he just was putting together the mathematics of it in his mind mm. and his understanding of when he would be reading, let's say the auras of the, the students practicing it, he could see what the mantras were actually generating in the auric field. And so what he did master was the synthesizing of, of all of these various uh, bodies of information and knowledge yogically. But I don't believe that there was this one system of Kundalini yoga that he studied and obtained from somebody else. Most of what I think he taught after maybe the first or second year came from his own creation because he figured out the sequences in, in, in what I, I call the mantric threads, the Kriya threads. And I, Including both the postures and the sound current, like everything that makes a Kriya, Kriya, you're saying that that's what makes it a thread. Yeah, I think he did learn as any of us who have studied, I've studied Kundalini Yoga, Ashtanga Yoga, Ayenga Yoga, Prana Vinyasa Yoga, Hatha Yoga, Mm -hmm. Most of the postures are all the same. You know, the asana practices, pretty much all the asanas are, various, uh, are, are the same. But each yogi, for example, those uh, early masters like um, Patabi Joyce, Krishna Machari, um, Ayenga, they learned the same sequences, but then when they taught their own system of Iyengar yoga or uh, Ashtanga yoga, they put the sequences together differently. And I think that's what Yogi Bhajan did when he created Kundalini yoga. Did, I don't believe there was ever a real Kundalini yoga that he learned over in India. I think he learned Hatha yoga and a variety of other yogas. And people on the web page have said that they've studied some of the early teachings and they figured out that he was also dabbling in extracting things from Tibetan Buddhism. Yeah, which makes sense. I mean, even like some of the academics and the, the research that kind of studied his historical timeline mm -hmm. that he never really like actually got into a body of work but was rather just grabbing different things and was like a yeah. master. It's interesting, the master synthesized like master taking the way I framed it is taking slices of truth from various bodies of work and then making it into a coagulation of something new, which is basically what you're saying. It's synthesizing. Uh, I just don't even know if I give him any credit for studying any of it, you know? Yeah, I, I don't really know if he ever studied with anybody, but. Um, I, so I you go to him, you tell him these yeah. things. Yeah, and he smiled and he, he would always clear everybody out of the room. Satsiman, go. Um, Premka, leave. Um, Narinian out. I just want to be here with my scientists. And then <laughs> he would smile. And I mean, he didn't know the word busted, but it was like we were busting him. Mm. And he would cop to it because he knew he couldn't defend our observation because we were scientists and we, and we were logical. And, and we were hungry students. I mean, we wanted the body of knowledge. <laughs> we, we wanted to be enlightened. We wanted to believe him, but um, we just figured out what the system was. And the system was that he was creating the system. It wasn't that there was a, a preordained system or body of knowledge. Mm. He was making it up as he was going along. And which gets to, to the next point. So <laughs> when we were transcribing his lectures, 95% of them were just drivel and garbage and junk. I mean, he'd start, like I said, today I'm going to talk about the essence of the neutral mind. He'd stay focused on the essence of the neutral mind at best five minutes. And then the next 95% of the lecture would be just wandering <clears throat> whatever he wanted to talk about that day. Um, uh -huh. And it was always just nonsense. And after like immersing yourself 
as a research scientist and you're reading through all this junk and then simultaneously we're reading other people's research projects and the sophistication of what they were writing up, like say Swami Rama in the Mayan Institute. It was just like night and day. And so then, wow. yeah, night and day. I mean, like you could just see substance and fluff, <laughs> substance and fluff. And so- This is 1976. 1976. So okay. in 1977, he says he wants us, because now we've resigned from the Kundalini Research Institute because we didn't want our names our good names, you know, as young budding meditation and yoga researchers to be associated long term with this project. So we resigned but, from But pause. So you have this confrontation, he kind of smiles and know he's busted, but there's nothing really more you can do in relation to him. So that's why you decide to resign because you're like, what else do we do here? And then you're thinking of your future as scientists. Yeah. Yeah. We realized and we also realized we'd been had. Um, Ramakiran Singh, he was in Jungian psychology at the, the time. And I, I went and became a patient in Gestalt therapy. Okay. And so I, I'm getting Gestalt therapy weekly and trading Kundalini yoga for it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and he's getting Jungian therapy and he's trading Kundalini yoga for it. <laughs> and he, he has this dream where there's a thousand, he's walking, He's running down the beach in Malibu and there's a thousand little tiny mutants in turbans chasing him. <laughs> and so his Jungian analyst says to him, I think um, you have a fear that your guru is gonna send his thousands of minions after you if you decide to separate and to leave him. And he went out from that office. He took his turban off. He went, got his hair cut, shaved his beard. And he never <laughs> went back. Wow. And so it took me a couple of more months because um, I was married to a woman. Her name was Ashwar Kakalsa. And she was so devoted. And she was his private, Yogi Bhajan's private cook on and off at all the solstices for like 10 years. And um, I just had to get the guts up to leave, knowing that it was probably going to blow my marriage up to her, <laughs> which eventually it did. But yeah, that's a tough decision, right? You're there saying, "Wow, you're you're rash, you you know what's truth, and your marriage is binding, and that's a real reality." Yeah, and so I decide to leave, and we're at this center, which is part of the Kalsa Clinic but our psychological division was called the Center for Health and Healing. And we're at Cedar Sinai and we have 14,000 square feet and there's the two Kalsa doctors and then there's the three of us, the psychologists, and then there's a whole other uh, branch separate, but we all had into uh, locking doors for all the treatment rooms. And there's a group of about 8,000 square feet of chiropractors, rebirthers, uh, dent, holistic dentists, body workers, hypnotherapists, um, re rebirthers. And so I, I had left and my former wife uh, had stayed and she gets a referral from Dr. Saram Singh. But you're married still. Yeah, we're still At married. This time. Okay, yeah, just clarifying. I'm out, I got short hair. Short, short hair short and she's in a turban still. She's still and this in is 1977. Uh, 1970, fast forward to 70, end of 78. Okay, end of 78, okay. okay. Yep. And she, I get a knock on my office door to come in and she's sitting in a room and this is woman elegantly dressed uh, in her 50s, early 50s and um, from Beverly Hills. And she's with two of her daughters. One's a 16 year old and a 15 year old. And one had an eating disorder, one was a cutter. And my former wife says to me, you know, it was her case, not mine, says, um, t 
tell Dr. Ron what you just told me. And so the mother nods to the two girls and the two girls say that Yogi, the mother had brought them to see Yogi Bhajan over the course of three or four sad days. And in the last couple of sad days, Yogi Bhajan had said to them, I want you to come uh, next Saturday alone and have your other sister come the following Saturday alone without your mother. And I'm going to be giving you some secret tantric healing teachings that will heal you of your illnesses. And, wow. you, and you mustn't tell your mother. And these girls had a beautiful relationship with their mother. And so, of course, they told their mother. Wow. So I guess the mother had gone to Dr. Saram, and Dr. Saram referred them to uh, Ishwar Karakalsa. And so I go in, I sit down, and they tell me that they're supposed to have these secret sexual healing teachings with the yogi. And so I tell the mother, you can never take these girls anywhere around him ever again. Um, you know, I, I just go through the, the appropriate boundaries that, that's necessary. And so I go back to my office and my wife comes home that night and she tells me like two or three other stories of other cases that either the people at the Khalsa clinic referred to her or Yogi Bhajan directly referred to her. And basically, he was trying to cover his tracks that people, mothers had confronted him. Oh, about, his, his, about their daughters. Attempted. Yeah, about their daughters. <laughs> and so she would talk to me at night and, and then I would tell her, I said, look, this is why you have to leave. This is, this is garbage. This is like so unethical. It's so inappropriate. Yes. You're gonna have to report it. Yes. And um, so, to make a long story short, when all of that layer started to come in, she, she took her turban off about a couple of months later, and then we left. And I, she and I had like nothing to do with uh, 3HO or Kundalini Yoga other than we occasionally still taught it. So by 1979, you both have left. She, after that, she had, she had when, when I read that story about you saying your wife was a psychotherapist too and, and had gotten this, this story about the daughters being kind of like seduced by him, um, that was like really devastating for Ishvara, it sounded like. Like, like that oh, broke her bubble. It, it, it absolutely, again, I was more of a scientist, to be honest. And I sure, my motivation was also somewhat pure in wanting to become enlightened and wanting to master Kundalini Yoga and master Zen meditation. But um, her motivation was like Premkas. It was so devoted to Yogi Bhajan as a guru. Mm. And she, I mean, she got up every day at 3.30 for the entire time we were married and she practiced. Mm. And she did everything that he said to do. And when she heard this, and it, and it happened more than once, I said, um, Ishwara, where there's smoke, there's fire. This mm. isn't even smoke. There's repeated fires here. Mm. You're a licensed mental health professional. You can't counsel these people and protect him. You've got to make a decision, uh -huh. your, your clients or him. And so she eventually left and um, we had, go ahead. I, I, I want to flag that for a moment because this is a really critical issue that is historic and systemic in our community of where there are professionals that by law really should be reporting things that haven't been reported. And I only know that because I've read it in people's testimonies. I'm not the best one to bring this conversation forward, but, 
but can you speak on that a little more? Like when, like, what are the ethical boundaries when somebody is a licensed professional by a state and then hears through counsel or whatever, there is, it, there's a different level of binding of, of responsibility than say somebody who's like a healer, calls themselves a healer and reads right. gems. You yeah, know? and she, she filed reports and all that we can ascertain from that period of history is that Yogi Bhajan was a master politician and he was very tight with Mayor Tom Bradley. He was very tight with the governor of New Mexico who was in the Clinton administration. He was even, um, there's photos of him with Hillary and Bill Clinton. The only thing we can ascertain is by hook or by crook, he was always able to weasel his way out of things using his high stakes pol political uh, connections. Uh. And so if he were alive today with the Me Too movement, as well as um, the current reporting laws, he along with Keith Ranieri, who just got 120 years in prison for some of these kinds of same crimes and misdemeanors, yeah. Yeah, Yogi Bhajan would be in prison. There's enough people that would uh, file criminal and civil complaints against him for the things that he did over the course of a lifetime that to this day, a lot of the people in the organization continue to deny it and say not true, that these are all lies. That yeah, and then the impact of children, say, growing up in this atmosphere where things in plain sight don't feel and aren't good, but aren't being spoken about as actual serious incidences. And I guess this is what I mean by like the difference between someone, say, as a licensed therapist versus somebody who calls himself a healer. Mm -hmm. we, this got enmeshed for us. And this, there, on one hand, there was like this, he's trying to legitimize the research and the science behind it and at the same time kind of advocating people not be be looking into the actual science of things yes and also using devoted professionals that he surrounded himself with to cover his tracks and in our case i mean no, no one ever referred anybody to me because I'd, I'd left a year or a year and a half before Ishwara had, but other professionals at the Kalsa Clinic, they referred to her and um, she was able to, you know, see and hear for her own eyes and ears that uh, this is wrong. I mean, th these are beyond unethical breaches. Astounding. These, astounding. And so we, we were both out by say the end of 1979. And we had had zero contact with, with anybody. And then in 1986, uh, Pamela's and Kate Feld's attorneys contacted me and asked me to do a ev psychological evaluation on each of them, and which I did. And I, I believe, if my memory serves me well, after I submitted my reports to Pamela's and Kate's attorneys, like within 10 days, they received a financial settlement from an unnamed Sikh charity in Vancouver. Unnamed Sikh charity. That's how Yogi Bhajan did it. He got uh, a, a Sikh charity in Vancouver to pay them off. And they, they got a pittance for like what they would, would have gotten today. I mean the settlements would have been in the millions, given that Kulsa security is worth uh, like a billions. I mean, a billions. Um, yeah, I want to just put a flag in that and just um, do a moment of silence for Kate Felt here. Yeah. Um, for the listeners that don't know, Kate Felt, um, her early name was Carta Perk Carr, and she's one of the earliest that we have documented that um, was raped and tortured and ab sadistically abused and was groomed, came in as a young teenager and the abuse started at, at like 19 when she had come in at 14. So may we hold the space.
there has been a long term ethos of silence. And <clears throat> when Kate and, and uh, Pamela left at that 1985-86, the fact that there was an actual documentation on paper in the court of law of this level of sadistic rape and abuse and other violations of like stealing her, um, you know, her intellectual property and formulas and just other things that were just very um, predatory and abusive. Um, and that that could get printed in paper and then get totally not looked at and covered over for several more decades. For me, blew my circuits wide open in the last couple of years. It's astounding, the level of uh, denial and mythification and excuse making that goes on. Um, there are current day senior teachers like Harry Jiwan, Gu Jagat, uh, Tej Ka Khalsa, who in their public classes prior to COVID, once Premka's book came out, were calling her a lying prostitute whore for what she wrote in the book, which is the truth. And that the victims of abuse are liars, cheaters, and just simply out for money. And, and these are young girls, and these are young women that were bitten, spit on, urinated on, beaten during sex. Um, I won't even go into all of the types of sex because it's just a little too disgusting for this format. Um, broken jaws, noses, broken arm, all during sex acts with Yogi Bhajan. And these senior teachers continue to protect him and say that the victims of, of this sordid and horrific abuse make it up and are seeking fame, money, and fortune. Pamela Dyson hasn't made a penny on the book. The book's done well, but I publish books too. In day, this day and age, you don't make a lot of money writing books. It, it, it's an act of love. But, the, but even so, that narrative was the exact narrative that we got in the early 80s. So yes. what I, when I heard that narrative from anybody who wants to put themselves on that side of things, which I don't even like framing, um, what it did for me is the memory of it was that was living in my body kind of showed up like, oh, that's so familiar. I remember hearing that in the atmosphere in the 80s. And I'm like eight you know, so of yeah. course you don't actually remember. It was just a nostalgia memory of like, oh, prostitute this, you know, and it's the it's a formulaic thing when somebody does goes against the grain. Yes, and then I remembered being a twenty three year old and hearing him say at the Santa Rosa ashram, "It's not quiet and private enough for us." Yeah, <laughs> and I went. Not quiet and private enough. I thought he gets up at 3.30 and does his sadhana. Like, <laughs> and, and then saying to Ramakiran, I think there's something going on with those, those girls and him. But there was so much, so much denial that, mm. that has gone on. But we're going to have to uh, bring this to a close in a couple of minutes for mm -hmm. today even though there's endless amounts more to, to talk about. But I recently have been in touch with a lot of people that have called me and some as young as 14 years old uh, when they were um, involved with Yogi Bhajan for like a decade in sex and really victims of torture and abuse telling me their, their stories. And um, I've had a series of uh, Zoom meetings with uh, Guru Singh, who from Los Angeles and in, in Seattle recently. And I just wanna say that there are some senior teachers like Guru Singh, and I don't know if people are aware of this, but him and his wife, when all of this surfaced, they took down Yogi Bhajan's photos, they've de-affiliated 
from him. They conduct their teacher trainings where they allowed the students to come up. Um, it was, I think, 176 students and for four or five and a half hours, they let people process feeling betrayed and uh, mm -hmm. disillusioned. And I wanna honor teachers like Guru Singh who are coming forward now in, in saying, okay, we, we believe the victims. We believe the stories. <clears throat> I also want to acknowledge Sat Santok Singh, um, his lovely daughter, Sananam Ka, uh, and I could go on. There's a whole host of people that have clearly come forward and said very early on, we believe the victims, we believe these stories, and we're not going to uh, stand for it and we're not going to uh, push the false narrative yeah and regardless if it's quote enough for any particular listener the fact that there's people in our community and teachers people that are in of influence that are acknowledging wow this is the stance and my process is still going to be my process of unwinding but let it be known i stand for the victims and that's really important in our community uh, can I ask you a question on that, though, because what would you say about, say, those same teachers that say in the early 80s, when these controversies came up, didn't do anything, they were silent. And so now they're coming out, but it's because now they have no, some will say that they have no other way than not to come out if they want to still have a good public interface, so to speak. But can you give context for why that was so different, say, or maybe it was more challenging, say, in the 70s when this was getting exposed or the 80s? Well, it's an excellent, excellent question, but it has so many multiple layers to it. First and foremost, we have the internet and social media. And so if you lived in Atlanta, Georgia, or in, in the ashram in uh, Toronto, Canada. Maybe you heard little bits of this, but people was, was so far away that they didn't hear a lot of it. The second thing is, I think it's idiosyncratic. A lot of the students, for example, and I'm not defending her, but Tej Ka, who I consider a wonderful teacher, um, up into all of this unfolding uh, in January, I was going to her class um, occasionally in West Hollywood. And she's a wonderful teacher. And she's a purist. And she's devoted her whole life to Yogi Bhajan and to the Dharma and to 3HO. And she teaches in a pure channel. But she's in complete and total denial. She, she believes that everybody's a liar and that Yogi Bhajan was this pure saint. And you can't crack that. You know, it's like the people that believe Donald Trump is the savior, saving them from the QAnon pedophilia cult of drinking baby's blood. I mean, it's just nonsense. So I think some of the people back then, they couldn't, for whatever reason, whether it was the purity of their devotion to Yogi Bhajan or the depth of their denial that they'd already spent 10 years or 15, 16 years in. And you know, you got that much time in, can you really entertain that the emperor doesn't have any clothes? Because that will mean you're gonna to have to leave and have a new identity. So I think for everybody, it's different. Uh -huh. And some people didn't really have the full story. And that's the difference between social media today and back then, you know, it was like rumors and stories, and they were always killed off by Yogi Bhajan because anybody, any woman that left was a drug addict, whore, prostitute living on the street who said anything negative about him uh, on a sexual level. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I'm going to have to go. I'm going to okay. have to go soon. Okay, well, let's wrap up. What I would like to say is um, it would be really great or like where I wanted to go more is how, where do, um, well, there's several more places. So I think I'd like to just invite you back.
because I'd like to be able to hear your lens on how you feel about um, the, the, the practice of Kundalini yoga and in how it's been delivered. But also, how about you leave us with the listeners um, of hearing these stories over again and hearing them now, um, I feel is like quite important because it's a part of creating this conversation towards healing. And at the same time, it can also be very re-traumatizing. It can bring up unprocessed trauma within us that we haven't dealt with. So mm -hmm. do you have any, any suggestions of, of um, as listeners are listening to episodes, how they can approach their own care? Well, first and foremost, if anybody listens in something that any of us say re-triggers them, is to immediately go see your therapist or your healer or your counselor or your coach or talk with a friend. And if you don't have any of that, what I call the wise counsel of support in your life, then do some journal writing and try to get centered and realize that you've been re-triggered and you have to get your nervous system back to a place of letting it quiet and, and settle. And then on, a, on an up note, but this is a controversial thing to say, is I think that there's the techniques, which one might call the technology of Kundalini Yoga, that are very useful and very healing, regardless of the teacher. And that it is possible to separate the technology from the teacher to gain the benefit, which worldwide, if you interview, and I do, when I was going to Kundalini Yoga classes two years ago, I would stand at, at the, outside at the end and I would ask people, how, how was it? How were you feeling before you came to the class? How, how do you feel now? And just gathering, you know, still a scientist, gathering data. And people benefit they get tremendous benefit from it. Proof is always in the pudding. You know, that's a basic scientific uh, outcome. What, what's the outcome? So I think that the technology and the teachings of the skill sets are very useful. I think that teachings in terms of the philosophy and the psychology is junk, junk philosophy, junk science, it, it, it doesn't have any substance to it. Meaning Yogi Bhajan, in how he created the technology, the technology I think will survive and can stand alone. He as a teacher has clearly fallen and he should fall to the wayside for the huge discrepancy in his character. He, uh -huh. didn't, he didn't practice what he preached. He didn't do sadhana. I spoke with um, Pamela last week. She said he hardly ever meditated. He didn't do sadhana. He didn't do the kriyas. And so there's a huge discrepancy between who he wanted us to be and who he was not. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that in that body of work has a lot of mystical, psychological kind of junk mail included so in the 3% that actually is housed in some, in some techniques that actually relate back to the scientific body. Right, and, and in the scientific body, the parts of the technology that, that work, they work because they're actually connected to asana practice, pranayama practice, uh, kriya practice, mantra practice, meditation practice, you know, Patanjali's seven limbs. And so you, you can't, I think when I read on the Facebook page, when people say, well, I could never go back to a yoga class or I could, you know, Kundalini yoga has helped me for 20 years and, and I could never practice it again. I think that's a little too extreme because if something was helping you before you found out that the person who invented it was a charlatan, you not necessarily do you throw away the methodology. But well, I just think, yeah, I think that would be a great another next podcast because I just feel like sure. I want to ask more questions here. And okay. a lot of people are really left with um, 
it would be very helpful to kind of have a gauge of of self experience of how to self monitor a little bit versus like what's mystical what am i believing yeah. of the mystical side of it and what is an actual neurological sensory experience that i can trust and being able yeah. to pull the two apart i think can really support people in this healing process of keeping what's good if that's a part of what they're supposed to do you know yeah and if they want to do it exactly. some people want to keep what's good and some people are so disillusioned and so muddied that they just want to throw it all away and, and move on. And <laughs> I salute both sides, whatever people want to do. And I can't agree more that either of those are completely valid and there's not a better or worse approach to these. It's really what's in resonance, what best feels like what you need. Yes, it's human subjectivity of what works for you. What works for me may not work for you. And what works for you may or may not work for me. And on that note, yes. Satnam. Satnam, um, I'm gonna get you right on back so we can keep this conversation for our listeners. I know you have to drop off, but I'm gonna play your song and uh, we'll he have you here in spirit with our song if you have to keep going, okay? Okay. And if there's a reason you want to share the song uh, or why you shared the song, you can go ahead and uh, share that with us. I think I love this song because it reflects to me that everything comes from the void, the emptiness, the sounds of silence, all creation, all creativity, all healing, all infinite knowledge and bliss and joy and light and love come from the sounds of the inner silence. Of the inner silence. Thank you. And here we go on that note. Thank you so much. You're Dr. welcome. Bye bye. Bye bye. Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. Because their vision softly creeping. Left his seas while I was sleeping And the vision that was planted in my brain Still remains within the sound of silence In restless dreams I walk alone Streets of cobblestone Neath the hill of a street lamp Turn my collar to the cold and damp When my eyes were stunned By the flash of a neon light That split the night And touched the sound of silence and in the naked light I saw ten thousand people maybe more people talking without speaking people hearing without listening people writing songs their voices i
Well, that is another episode of the Uncomfortable Conversations podcast, the untold stories of the 3HO Kundalini Yoga community. Thank you so much for tuning in. Please like, share, review, and subscribe to this podcast. Spread it around the world. Let these stories be heard. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you on the next episode.